G'day legend, welcome to the Noob Spro Podcast. I am the show host Shrek. This is the show where I go around the world and interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters and just dig into their tips, tricks and expertise to help you become a better Spiro. If that's what you're after, you just, you're having a dry spell, you're in the right place, you're here with me. I've been dry for six weeks, believe it or not. It's a, it's a shocker run, just a culmination of work, uni and uh, and family stuff and you know like I'm, I'm definitely missing the water and just that that mental health space that it is to a lot of us and uh, um, recently talking about mental health recently in recent episodes I've talked about the 48 hour effect I actually buggered that up it's called the three day effect and it's a free audiobook on audible.com if you go to noobspiro.com forward slash audible you can actually get that and another book free um, so three day effect talking about what these three day experiences in the wilderness um, just getting back to basics no technology what they can do for you on a lot of levels and there's a couple of different case studies in it and some interesting research comes out as well uh, I'd encourage you to check that out I recently got all the way through it but uh, anyway I digress um, today we are chatting with S, the, the crew members of SV Dallas um, they're the number two YouTube sailing channel uh, nearly 600,000 subscribers, more than 7 million views uh, a month, and they've spent 10 years sailing around the world, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Brian Troutman, he he's a Spiro himself, and we briefly check in with Karen as well, although she's looking after the young one, and they're out on a 53-foot yacht, and it's just some of the experiences and lessons learned from sailing around the world. It's a bit of a different episode today. It's um, less sparing and more sort of sparing and sailing lifestyle. Um, I hope you enjoyed anyway, but um, I did want to get quickly into some shout outs because I haven't done enough recently and uh, I'll give you four quick ones and then let's get into this interview. So the tips are helpful, but the hosting is what keeps me listening to this podcast. Best episodes have both the hosts. I love when they imitate American Americans kills me. Uh, that's from Nicole. Uh, amazing podcast. Love it. As I did their book, 99 Tips. I've learned heaps in the short amount of time I've been listening. Guests from all over the world, and there's some good laughs in there as well. That was from The Wizard of Wiz. And amazing podcast. Love it. As I did their book, learned heaps. And last review, epic podcast. I'm based in the UK and lots of the content is still relevant. A must listen for obsessed Spiros. And uh, along with that, some fantastic news from both the major Australian sponsor in Adreno, adreno.com.au. If you use the code NoobSpiro at checkout, you can use that now online in their scuba store, online in the spearfishing store, and you can use it in store, all four Adreno stores. And if you're an American listener, then I would encourage you to check out neptonics.com. Use the code Noob10 to save 10% off all your purchases store wide. Um, awesome to have both a major sponsor in the US and Australia, where our major listener bases are, although UK and uh, NZ aren't too far behind. So, hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. Let's crack on. Longer intro today. My apologies. Let's get in. Brian Troutman, SV Delos, and a little bit of Karen. Here we go. Have you been chewing through Noob Spiro podcast episodes? just sucking down every morsel and good tip that comes your way. Good news for you, there's more. At patreon.com forward slash noobspiro, become a patron listener, support the show, and unlock exclusive content. There's an episode there right now, a two-hour episode on equipment just for you, the ones that are frothing on all things spearing. Check it out, patreon.com forward slash noobspiro. Welcome to the show. I've got... Brian here from SV Dallas, a famous, very well-known and regarded uh, YouTube channel. Number two in the world, apparently. Does that annoy you, Brian, that you're not number one? Oh, I think that we're number one in some ways, you know. I like to think about it that way. I don't even, I'm not even aware of who the number one is, so I'm just going to... Neither am I. <laughs> you're number one to me, so that's awesome. And um, Awesome. Your lovely wife is hopefully going to join us at some stage during the interview as well, but I notice you guys have got a young child on board. Um, man, 10 years sailing around the world, that's a pretty hectic journey. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, well, it, it, it has been a while. It surprises me every time I think about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, what started out is, you know, what should have been an 18 month sabbatical break from work where I was going to figure out my life and what I wanted to do with the rest of it uh, has turned into a lifestyle that I, I love and, and 
Karen, my wife, loves very much and we're very passionate about. And we pretty much just do whatever it takes to to keep it going, to, you know, to, to keep running the boat and to keep sailing, to keep traveling, uh, which at this point means making YouTube videos, uh, social media about it and uh, funding the lifestyle that way. And, you know, it's, it's, we've, we've, you know, my, my whole goal when I left uh, was to basically just step out and yep. to step out of the normal nine to five. And I, I sort of had this point in my early thirties, I was like a software developer. And I realized that, you know, my, the favorite part of my day is the bus ride to and from work. And I was like, you know, why is that, Ryan? Why, why is that? You know, it's because nobody could bother me. Nobody could drag me into a meeting. There was no emails I had to answer. And, and I could just stare out the window and watch the road roll by. And I was like, that's no way to live your life. Mm. And, uh, and so I, I saved up some money. I sold everything, the house, the car, the flat screen TVs and, and, uh, you know, wait be, for it to bought. You'd be missing the TV though. <laughs> well, well, it turns out you can have a, pro, you can have a projector. You don't really need a TV, right? <laughs> yeah. No, none of us miss TV. I, I haven't. No, I, no, I might, it's, it's, uh, it's crap. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, made it, but my goal is to make it to New Zealand, uh, yep. made it to New Zealand and oh. uh, that's where I, I actually met my wife there. And then I was like, you know what? There's no way that, uh, that I'm going to stop now. And so we scraped a little bit of money together and we sailed up to, uh, what was it? Fiji and then Vanuatu and then the Solomon islands. And then we ended up in uh, Cairns, up in Queensland mm -hmm. uh, where we were super broke. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we, uh, managed to sail down to Bundaberg, yep. uh, in Southern Queensland and then, uh, parked the boat for a while, uh, moved to Melbourne, um, where uh, Karen, uh, my wife, was going to school at uh, okay. RMIT. Ah. And then we lived there for like a year, uh, saved up some money, and then we took off again and, and uh, never looked back. So it's, it's, been, it's been a crazy adventure. It's been amazing. I love it. That's crazy. There's a few touch points there. Like um, I'm originally from New Zealand, but I live in Queensland now. And um, as you were talking, it reminded me of a, another couple I've had on here who have embarked on a sailing journey of their own. Um, Jesse Cripps and Michael Takash, they, when I first chatted with them years and years ago, they were just spearfishing and loving it. And they've bought a yacht, a yacht since and, um, and they're sa a sailboat and they're sailing around the world, kind of emulating what you're doing. But like, I think so many of us can relate to your story, you know, to, to just being sick of a nine to five or, you know, in my case, it's a seven to seven, to be honest. But, um, <laughs> but well, you know, somebody once told me, he's like, you'll never look back on your life and wish you'd spent more time in the office. And I was mm. like, you know what? That's a pretty damn good point. Mm -mm. Really. If you think about it, like just enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I've become aware of is there's a reality to sailing as well, though. Like this, it seems to require so many um, characteristics that most of us have sort of like we're just too comfortable, you know, like resilience and having to fix stuff that you've got no idea how to fix. And there's no one, there's no tradesperson that you can just call sometimes to come and fix something. You've just got to do it all yourself. Were, were you like, were you that sort of person before you started um, sailing? I mean, I thought I was, but it turns out that I knew like way less than I should have. And I think that's fine because, you know, I was, resourceful and willing to learn and you know sailing <laughs> at one point to me was described by somebody as like you know standing outside in the cold while perny pouring buckets of water over your head and literally <laughs> just cr crumpling up money and throwing it into the ocean and you know like some people say like boat stands for like one boat unit is a thousand dollars or a thousand yeah. bucks or whatever it's like you know bring on another thousand is what boat yeah. stands for so yeah. it's, it's expensive it's a lot of work it's it's a lifestyle that you really have to love but you know the dividends are are mm. it pays you back in spades for sure definitely. for sure so yeah. you, you actually met your wife while you were sailing though is that is that is that part of it as well so you met her yeah, in new that, zealand while the sailboat was there in new zealand what, what, yeah which, so what, my my wife is swedish mm -hmm. uh, and she was backpacking in new zealand with some of her girlfriends uh, also from scandinavia and we met up at a party we were in the viaduct in auckland and okay. uh, i invited her to go uh sailing for the weekend out to a winery, uh, I think it was Waikiki. Waikiki, I'm probably yeah, Waikiki. Island, yep. Yeah. So there's like a, there was like an electronic music festival at a winery. I was like, hey, why don't you and your girlfriends come along? It'll be great. 
<laughs> you never think they're going to say yes. And then she did. And, uh, you know, that weekend is, well, it's been a long weekend, but amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool, man. It's a good story. And um, have some of the people like, because you've got so many subscribers on YouTube and stuff. And so it's SV Dallas on YouTube. Have some of those um, subscribers been with you for the whole journey, like from the yeah. start? Yeah, some have. Like, you know, we've, especially now that we're back in the States, we run into people every now and then. They're like, Brian, I watched, I've been watching, you know, your channel or your blogs or your, your videos since you were in Mexico, you know, hmm. which was in 2000 nine 2010 mm. you know when i first left and that's always cool it's cool to know that you know somebody thinks we're interesting enough to keep watching anyway yeah so we were chatting briefly before we got started while we we're just doing sound checks and stuff and you were talking about um where you were with the with the with the covid lockdown and stuff so can you sort of catch us up with the last 12 months what's what's happened yeah well you know we we uh karen and i decided to have a, a baby and so uh when we were in the caribbean uh, we were practicing a lot and, uh, it worked. And so we, <laughs> when we continued sailing until she was, uh, like seven months pregnant. And if you've never seen a seven month old pregnant lady sail, it's, it's, it's a hilarious sight. Like she's a pretty small girl to begin with. And uh, her belly was like, it looked like she swallowed a basketball. Uh, and we, we left the boat in Florida. We, uh, flew to Sweden so, uh, and, and our daughter was born there, uh, in Sweden. And then mm. when she was four months old, we flew back to the boat, uh, in the Caribbean in Antigua. Uh, mm. and then we, we carried on the season, uh, right up until, uh, the early part of March where, you know, this, this strange thing happened, you know, Karen's mom called her and said, Hey, do you know that they just canceled all the flights from Europe to the U S and I was like, what? That's, that's insane you know, what's going mm -hmm. on? Cause we're in the middle of nowhere. You know, we're, we have some cell reception, we have a satellite, we get email and news and internet from, mm -hmm. but uh, we're, we're largely off, off the grid. And with, um, with a newborn baby with, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's how we like to do it. <laughs> character, char character building. That, that's yeah. what, my, what my dad would say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, uh, luckily we had, we had planned on spending, about maybe six weeks in these uninhabited islands. It's called the Ragged Islands, which is the very southern part of the Bahamas. It's actually only about 80 miles from Cuba. Okay. Beautiful place, nice sandy, crystal clear water. Um, nobody lives there. There's one village that has about 30 people in it. That's <laughs> three islands away. The closest town is, you know, a couple days sail up North, no airport, nothing like that. Heck. And this news came in and, you know, we just made a decision, like, what are you going to do with the time? And, and, you know, ports in the U S were closing islands were closing. Uh, we felt like, you know, we had fuel on board. We had, uh, food on board. And we said, well, you know, what do we need to do to, to extend our stay? If, if things get really, really bad, uh, what, what do we need to do? And, and, uh, it turns out that, you know, we were able to really conserve our resources. Uh, we make our own water, we make our own electricity with solar and wind power. So that was sweet. Mm. Um, we were doing cloth diapering for Sierra, so that wasn't a problem. And then, I did a lot of spear fishing, you know, mm. so we were, we were going after lobster. We were going after, um, lion fish, uh, hog fish, um, bass, like, like a red kind of snapper sort of thing. Okay. Yep. Uh, like, and, like um, a man mangrove snapper, like, a. yeah, there was, there was some mangroves in there. There's, you know, there was, there was all, all kinds, uh, to, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm not the best with my fish identification species. I probably know about like my top four or five that I yep. really am favorites yeah. of. And, uh, I can kind of like see a glimpse of them and, and that's what I, I know. Okay. I'm going to go after that. Pretty cool. The lionfish, um, have taken on a peculiar popularity, I think due to, you know, the, their invasive nature and people have got on board eating them and, and acquired a real taste for it. There seems to be a market for them now, but there's a real art to preparing them to eat. Um, did you, how did you sort of the first lionfish you processed, did you make any mistakes? Uh, how was that? <laughs> well, we, we've been fishing lionfish for a couple, a couple of years now, uh, ever since we got into the Caribbean. Cause like you said, they are, 
invasive and they, you know, they prey on, on the smaller fish, uh, all the other uh, juvenile species of the reef, and they have no natural predators. And so, you know, they've been working their way down the Caribbean chain and now they're, they're everywhere and, and nobody knows what to do with them. So it's pretty much open season on lionfish. When we first got into the Caribbean, into Grenada, we uh, went to a, uh, like a dive school. Mm. And um, we were doing some scuba diving with them. And anytime their instructors went out, they were carrying this big plastic tube with what looked like a, like an inverted kind of uh, traffic cone or mm. you know working cone orange on the end that was cut into four segments. And then they had a pole spear like mm. with the three like barb tips on it. Yep. And they would just shoot every lionfish they saw. And I was like, well, can I do that? They're like, yes, of course. Like kill all of them you can because they're really bad for the environment. They're not supposed to be here. Uh, they taught us how to clean them, how to, you know, take the scissors, cut the spikes off the back, cut mm -hmm. them open, check out the contents of their belly, see what they've been eating just for curiosity. And then, you know, we got this cookbook called the Lionfish Cookbook. And it's it's an incredibly delicious white meat. Yeah, wicked. Uh, it's tasty. I love it. Uh, hmm. So we we do. I, I I do quite a bit of that. Yeah. You know? Awesome. Awesome. You got to be careful though, because if if you get stung with that, uh, you know, it's it bothers you a bit. It's quite painful. <laughs> is there any uh, treatment? What do you do? Is it just like a warm water thing? If you do get stung, I don't know. I mean, people say warm water. People say pee on it. I I personally yeah. think you just you just sit back and and. Just and chill for a while. Wait it out. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 probably not going to kill you, is what they say. So you had six weeks stuck in the Bahamas with your newborn and a lovely wife stuck on a sailboat, spearfishing every day. That sounds awful. It sounds like a terrible way to spend lockdown. Well, it turned out to be sixteen weeks at the end. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> it took like it took uh, yeah four four months before we could leave. Uh, but yes, that is pretty much it. We, we ended up, the, the biggest problem is we ran out of uh, liquor. Uh, and uh, luckily, we, we got a couple of stills on board. So we were, we were brewing up some moonshine out there. And uh, yeah, nice. that was, it was probably actually looking back on it, one of the best experiences of my life. I yeah, really enjoyed that time. Yeah. What, what about eating seafood and fish every day? Like, how did that go? Did you, do, you, do you get sick of it? Do you get more and more creative? I mean, <laughs> what happens? Man, to be honest, there were some days I would wake up and just wish I could spear a cheeseburger. Like I would have done anything <laughs> to, for that. It's just, yeah. you know, like I never thought you could get sick of lobster or conch or, mm -hmm. you know, grouper. But I guess variety is the spice of life, right? Yeah. And, what about yeah. um so so for seafood cooking recipes and stuff like you've got you've got a couple of cookbooks by the sounds of it um what's you what what are your go to sort of dishes with um you know like some of the more you know the the better white fl fish flesh fish like hogfish and groper and stuff oh man my go to is probably fish tacos I love a good fish taco mm. uh, can do a pretty decent curry I made a lot of chowders I did like a one of my favorite was I did like a uh conch have you ever had conch before no nah, it's like a giant that? snail okay. okay it's like you know if you ever seen in the movies like the guy like tilts back his head and he blows the horn at the sun the sunset yeah, 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 like yep. that's a conch shell yep yep and there's it's quite a trick to get into them uh but once you get into them and you, you get the insides out uh, and you, you tenderize it and cook it properly it tastes almost like a scallop it's delicious okay uh so i I did quite a bit of chowders, like a, a conch uh, and grouper chowder, which I was quite proud of. Mm -hmm. And then we, I love to spear fish that are just uh, big enough to fit on the, uh, we have like a barbecue on the back. Yep. So I just gut it and I cut slits in the side and a little bit of uh, salt, pepper, lime if you have it. And I just grill the whole thing right on the mm -hmm. barbecue. And, uh, and so you know, just moonshine and, and grilled fish on the back. That's terrible with the sunset. <laughs> yeah it's uh, you know this is life <laughs> yeah man you're living the dream for for some of us i think um have you read read much books like i think there's a book called the three-day effect it's like these um guys have studied going into nature and just getting off the grid for three or four days and how beneficial it is for our physiology and our and our, and our mental state and stuff like that i have not read that but mm. i wholeheartedly agree with the idea 100 percent well, your your lifestyle's you know really congruent with the with the idea, but it seems like 
a lot of society's waking up to this idea and um, obviously you did it a, a bit earlier than, than a few people have caught on. Um, but this, this, the sailing journey intrigues me. Like down in um, New Zealand, did you visit a place called the, the, the Marlborough Sounds at the top of the South Island there? Uh, I didn't sail down there, but we, we bought a cheap Japanese car and drove down there. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, and yeah. did a little bit of trip around, so I, I kind of know the yeah, kind of know the area. Yeah, nice. I, I, I've got some friends, and they they lease or they rent a sailboat. Um, I think nearly annually or biannually, and they just sail around the Marlborough Sounds, and they get scallops and you know uh, crayfish, and you know they just live off the land. They go h- land hunting as well, but they take their kids down there, and there's there's a bunch of these guys, and they all do it. I'm really envious, but. I don't have the the sailing sort of knowledge to pull off a trip like that. Um, how, how do you how do you start? Like how do you, you know, what are the boats? Do you, do you recommend like going and crewing on someone's boat first and sort of learning the ropes that way? I mean, what's the learning journey? Yeah, I would I would definitely recommend that. I think uh, uh, the, the one of the things that I first did, which was super beneficial, is I sailed small boats, so little sailing dinghies, and just about every place is going to have a sailing club that has small boats, little sailing dinghies. It's usually a kid's club, but sometimes like on the weekends, they'll also take adults out for lessons. Like you will learn more about sailing in the wind just by feeling every, you know, the pull of the lines in your hand, like how the sail feels, what it sounds like, no instruments, nothing, (laughs) just you and the boat and the wind and the water. And, uh, you know, from that, I, I just went and volunteered on, on race crews. Like I, they, I was rail meat, you know, I was just the guy whose sole purpose <laughs> is human movable ballast. And I sat on the rail and I learned and I eventually worked my way up to work in the bow. Uh, and I kind of learned that way, but you know, a lot of it's common sense. Hmm. If, if you have common sense and uh, you're, you're probably going to be pretty good. I mean, I necessarily wouldn't cross an ocean without getting a little bit of training first, but hmm. It's, hmm. It's, it's not entirely difficult. Yeah. Hmm. So before you mentioned, you know, the season, you know, sailing definitely seems to have seasons like there's bands of, you know, months where you get prevailing winds and the conditions are favorable for sailing. Uh, uh, what are they different? They're obviously different everywhere. Can you give me an overview of that sort of thinking? Yeah, well, the idea is generally to not die by way of hurricane, typhoon, <laughs> and or cyclone. And so, you know, for example, I left Mexico uh, in March and the Southern hemisphere cyclone season ends in May. Mm. And then you basically have until, you know, November to get somewhere out of Dodge. And so, Mm. you know, we were in Tonga in November and then, or actually October. And then we decided to sail to New Zealand, uh, to get out of uh, the cyclone season and then come around, you know, April, May again, then we sailed back up to the islands and then got back down to uh, Australia to seek shelter uh, the following year. And and so it's, you know, hurricane seasons are, they've been predictable for a long time. And, mm. you know, there's this thing called pilot charts, which has 200 plus years of observations and wind speeds and storm probabilities and everything Mm. on it. And you can pretty much look at that and be like, you know what, being in the Caribbean in September is actually a pretty bad idea. (laughs) And so we'll sail North and that's why we're in Maine right now. Uh, And so we, we tend to sail seasonally because you know, this boat, it's our permanent home. We don't, you know, some people can leave their boat, you know, they take it out of the water you know, go into a marina, whatever, go to a house, wait it out. But this this is our permanent home. And so we we tend to sail her out of Dodge, mm. uh, you know, out of out of the storm zones. And, you know, in the Pacific, it's cool because you can move north and south, right? Like, you know, you can go down to New Zealand and then when it's up, you can go back up towards the equator through the islands, get up into the Marshall Islands and um you know you can you can kind of play around with it. But it's mm. it's pretty fascinating. I love hearing spearfishing adventures. I love hearing about the challenges, the amazing moments, the special people, the fish, the crew, the prep, the highlights. I love the whole lot. And there's another place where you can hear and read about people's spearfishing adventures, people just like you. Check it out, spearingmagazine.com. Every story is full of those stoke moments that fuel the fire 
and get you excited for your next spearfishing adventure. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Generally, when I start talking spearfishing safety, freediving safety, it's when people turn away, turn it off, and carry on and ignore it. If you're in your first couple of years spearfishing, freedivingsafety.com will give you a fantastic foundation to not only make you a safer Spiro, but it'll also help you to have more fun, take home more fish, and look after your mates. Check it out at freedivingsafety.com. I'm going to try and steer clear of silly questions like maybe what's your favourite place in the world to sail because I think probably you've got you've got many and they're all for different reasons but um what's it like spearfishing off off a sailboat are there any particular difficulties you have with it uh in some places uh i'd say the biggest difficulty is well there's two that come to mind number one is you'll find some parts of the world that are completely decimated by overfishing uh mm. certain parts in the south china sea and asia uh, parts of Indonesia are getting better, Southern Philippines, um, around Borneo, you know, it's, mm. it's just, a, it's a tragedy. And so we really got turned off by that. Mm. And then you get to some places that, you know, it's fantastic and it's healthy and you're like, well, I feel like I can fish again. Um, and that's, you know, that's amazing. The other thing is sharks. Mm. Uh, so some of the, craziest experiences i've had have been in these really far out remote places um like coco's keeling is mm. a good example you know that's what it's like 11 or 1200 nautical miles off the western coast of wa and okay. um yeah i think there's only there's only a flight there from perth i'm pretty sure it is australian territory mm. but uh it's in it's just a little atoll in the middle of the indian ocean and any time you pull your trigger, the sharks are trained to hear that sound and then they come in. And most of the time they're black tips, white tips, they're, you're like little puppy dogs, right? Mm -hmm. You know, three, four feet, just over a meter. But every once in a while, like something will come up from a little bit deeper, a gray or maybe an oceanic white tip I've seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, then it gets a little bit scary. You kind of have to be careful. And so we, we tend to like, you know, spear something, we move right away. We don't do it again. Everybody gets in the, the dinghy. We, we usually fish from our dinghy or spear from our dinghy. Yep. Uh, and then we'll, we'll drive like, you know, a few hundred meters away and then we'll try that spot. Yeah. That's a, that sounds like a best strategy. I think like when you, yeah, when you're dealing with sharks, it's just to get up and move somewhere, even if it's just a few hundred meters away, it seems to make a difference. That just gives them time to settle down, settle down again. Yeah, exactly. Excuse me. I'm going to open my, my second beer here. You're okay. <laughs> there you go. okay. It's it's essential interview <laughs> fuel. The problem is I've got four interviews today, Brian. So if I start with beers now, then oh no! By the by, the last interview, I'm be barely done. coherent and I'm bad enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll enjoy this one for you. Um, yeah, you know, spearing off boats, off sailboats, definitely intrigues me. I think there's just um, apart from common sense, what are the, what are some of the other sort of the 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 traits you need to be good at sailing? Or, or even just a good crew member on a sailboat. I think you need to always think about making the other crew happy, like going out of your way to try and make their life easier. Because if you like, if you think about, you know, what a small space a sailboat is mm. and it's always moving, the weather's always not nice. Like sometimes you can't always go outside and, you know, on this boat, it's a 53 foot boat, but we've sailed with six and seven adults mm. on it all the time. And, you know, sometimes it's hot and it's sticky and it's stinky. And like, you know, somebody shits up in the forward head and then it smells like shit in the boat. And you're yeah. like, this is not, not <laughs> pleasurable. Well, you know what? I got to get out of here. <laughs> so you just you got to be kind. You got to be considerate. You got to be a good cook. If you're yeah. a good cook, it, it goes, it, it's a long way for, crew morale mm -hmm. uh, everybody you got to be willing to do any job at any time do night watch there's no that's not my job on this boat everything mm -hmm. is everybody's job and if something needs to be done then if you see it and you notice it needs to be done you better do it and yeah that's, right that's otherwise you don't have any place here so conscientious like and courteous of others who like uh, it is a very cramped space i mean is cabin fever a thing for you guys yeah absolutely uh <laughs> You know, I mean, the, 
we do have the cabins down below. Um, we have the deck up above, which is kind of like our you know porch, if you will. Uh, when we're in the tropics, we have uh, kite boards, we have paddle boards, we have wake boards, uh, oh. we have scuba diving, we have swimming, we have beach toys. You know, it's pretty much anything you can do to to get yourself off the boat, entertains, maintain your sanity, get some exercise. Um, yeah. So what has it given you, like, obviously, some, I think some of the, the experience would be quite difficult, like there would be some, um, some, some discomfort involved. So what has sailing made you appreciate more? A hot shower. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I watched you guys crawl up on an island the other day, and just walking around on dry land must be feel pretty different after being on the on a, on a sailboat for so long. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, we 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 you you don't take anything for granted, I guess. And one of the things that I've really noticed is that we cherish things a lot more. Like it's, it's so common to, you know, especially if you live in a, a, a civilized place with grocery stores and things that if you run out of tomatoes or avocados or cheese, you just go to the store and buy it. But mm. can you imagine if you ran out and you couldn't get any more for like two months, <laughs> like when you bite into that next avocado, how yep. good that's going to be. And mm. we constantly get that. And so simple things like a hot shower or, you know, having a cheeseburger or a pizza you know, it's just like, it's, it's mind blowing. And you yeah. really, you really cherish those, those little things. And then, you know, like for us going for a ride in a car is actually a lot of fun because we don't get to do it very often. So we're mm. kind of like, you know, dogs sticking our heads out the windows in the wind, like, Oh, it's, it's going so fast. It's going like 60 knots, you know, where you still <laughs> only going six knots. This is crazy. Yeah. Uh, so everything becomes really fresh and real when you, when you get back mm. from a long trip, you know, so I'm looking at your boat now. You're, I'm on the SV Delos website, um, and you've got like a live map. Is that up to date with in terms of where you guys are? Well, if it's not, it's broken. So I hope it is. Oh, so it's a GPS tracker, is it? With live, it's got like live weather conditions and stuff. I think. Yeah, it's actually uh, from a, a Kiwi company. It's from Predict Wind, uh, which is in uh, uh, I don't know if it's the North Island or the South Island. Yeah. Um, but it's it's literally. Uh, a GPS uh, tracker mm. that we turn on and it, it sends our current position uh, mm. up to a magical satellite and then it beams it to the interwebs and shows up on, on the page there. And it's got a, like a track mark from where you guys have been recently. So you're, you're sort of hanging out on the East Coast, yeah? Yeah, we're, we're currently up in Maine uh, mm. because uh, it was the hurricane season and we were tired of being hot. And so we just decided to sail north as far north as we could until the temperatures got cooler. And uh, the Canadian border is still closed. So hmm. we sailed as far north as we could. And then we turned around and now that it's cold and we're freezing our butts off, we'll sail back to the tropics and go swimming again. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. So do you do, like, do you do a lot of line fishing up there? Or have you got like a temperate water wetsuit? for for spearfishing yeah i mean i haven't done a lot because well a it's it's really cold and b the visibility is like the worst i've ever seen it's i i mean i i we there's a lot of lobster fishing up here mm. and we constantly can't avoid all the floats and the lobster pots and we ran over one the other day and i got caught in our propeller oh, and i no. put a gopro and a pole over the side of the boat to try and see if it was actually stuck on our propeller i couldn't even see the hull of the boat so the viz is like you know less than half a meter oh, wow. maybe like a third of a meter it's it's terrible and so i haven't even been in the water at all we went yeah. swimming a couple times but i don't know it's mm pretty intense so have you have you have you got have you got netflix so I mean, it's a silly question but um i i have a reason for asking netflix oh yeah. yeah so have you have you watched that my octopus teacher oh man i have it in my uh my saved list to watch maybe mm. i'll watch it tonight man watch yeah, cause it. somebody else recommended it to me and i was like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna watch that I only recently sounds... watched it. Like a couple of guys in the community were chatting about it, and so I got onto it. And it's crazy, like this 
But he's the this the South African guys in water about maybe similar ocean temps to what you've got up there in Maine at the moment. And he's yeah. just, he he wants to do it in a pair of shorts though. And so he does. Yeah. So I'm just yeah, like well. holy moly, like South Africans are hardcore though. We <laughs> sailed there. We were there for like two years and mm. we did we went diving off the coast uh, like off in False Bay and also mm. around Cape Town. And it was like six degrees or yeah. sometimes it would get up to eight degrees and mm. people are like surfing and swimming. I'm like, you guys are nuts. I don't know, that's that's a little cold for me. I'm like a warm water guy, I guess. I am too, but like at times in my life where I've challenged myself to get into the cold water, there's something remarkable that happens like in you, you know, you, when you come out, the, there's no more alive feeling in the world. It's just the getting in is uh, the hard part. You're right about that. Like we sailed up in Svalbard uh, like two years ago, which is, it's about 1200 miles north of Norway. It's 600 miles from the North Pole. Wow. It's like 80, 80 degrees north. It is way up there. Yeah. The water temperature is one degree Celsius during the, <laughs> the height of the height of summer. <laughs> and uh, we decided to jump in in our mm. underwear. Yeah. Uh, the entire crew did. And it was, uh, yeah, it's like you come out and you feel like, yeah, you feel alive, but you also feel like there's one billion needles stabbing you all over your body. Mm. Just the, the stinging is crazy. One degree is pretty crazy. I think I did one, three. One degree is cold, man. <laughs> I did three or four degrees. I jumped in in um, Lake Baikal in, in Russia because I've that lake's always intrigued me and I always wanted to swim there and I, I tried it. But, um, yeah, laying on the sun afterwards, you know, and all the needles fade away. Jeebus, it's a, it's a good feeling. Yeah, no, it is. And you do, you do feel alive. You're, you're never like dreadful that you did it. You're always happy afterwards. It's the leading up to doing it. That's always the tough part for me. Mm -hmm. So you've got southerly winds there at the moment. Um, is it a difficult sail south when you, you've got winds like that or you just, yeah, sort of <laughs> that's what I've been, that's what I've been told. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, now we just take it slow. Like every couple of days you might get a break in the weather. Like we were way up North, right at the Canadian border mm. uh, last week. And we had a two day break in the weather and we used it to move, you know, a hundred miles in the right direction. And now we're, we, we're going to sit here for a while. And then, you know, it's a game of patience. You, you mm. can't fight the wind. You can't fight the waves. You'll always lose. And so it's just a matter of being patient and biding your time. And eventually you'll get a break and then you can, run a little bit west and south and we sort of do it in chunks like that yeah cool so one other thing you know like I, I kind of looking at what you've done and what you guys have been able to achieve is you've got this awesome youtube channel and um chatting with you beforehand it sounds like you've got editors in different parts of the world and you guys coordinate to create this awesome project and it, it sounds like you've got a, a pretty cool community um with the youtube footage and stuff how, how does your editing process work what's the workflow Oh, uh, well, we, we've always made a conscious decision to not plan or not storyboard our filming because A, we're, we're not actors and we're not models by any means. And so it just, we just can't do that. Mm. Uh, whatever we do has to be off the cuff. It has to be just whatever we happen to be doing at the moment. And so, you know, we'll just be like, okay, if we're going to go do this adventure today, like we're going to go up here, a hike in this forest, then we'll say, okay, we're going to film this experience and we'll film, you know, shots of us taking the dinghy right in, maybe some drone shots of the boat at anchor, like us stepping off the dinghy, setting the anchor, like kind of these B rolly type things. And, uh, you know, after we film this experience, it uh, we upload the files, uh, proxy files, which are smaller versions of the files, uh, to like Dropbox or something via our satellite, yeah. Uh, to some of our friends, and uh, we used to do all the editing ourselves, hmm. uh, but we felt that we were only editing because it was taking us you know, like 30 to 40 hours per video. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to release one video, like we release one video a week. It was actually really affecting our lifestyle. Yeah. And we said, well, if we want to be out here, there's no use. What's the point in sitting in a boat if you're in front of the computer all day? Mm -hmm. And so as we met people over the years that had sailed with us and that we liked, and we thought they had a, 
a cool vibe. Then we said, Hey, you know, do you want to help us continue on this project? We'll pay you for your work and you can literally live anywhere in the world. You can sit around in your underwear editing videos in Indonesia if you want. And <laughs> a lot that's, that's, you know, that's really attractive to a lot of people. And so mm. we get help that way. Um, and, uh, so we, we basically send these proxy files, uh, via Dropbox or Amazon web services to our, our friends and mm. they kind of look through the footage and then we'll have a chat and they'll tell us, Oh, you know, this is where I think the story was, or this is where, you know, I thought it was. And we'll kind of say, okay, you know, go with that idea, that concept. And cause mm. it, at the end of the day, it really is all about telling a story. Yeah. And if you can tell a story and you can get, keep, keep people engaged uh, and, and have some characters and, and have fun with it. You have to have fun. Yeah. Then, you know, you have something that's entertaining and people will watch it to, to live vicariously or to learn something or, you know, whatever the reason is. But, um, hmm. you know, so that's, so after, after they look at the footage and come up with the story, then, um, uh, they send us back a preview. Uh, it's like a low quality version. It doesn't have any audio tweaks or anything. So it's pretty rough. And we say, okay, you know, I like this, or maybe I don't like this. And they'll, you know, further refine it a little bit. And then they'll send us the, uh, we work in Adobe Premiere. Hmm. Uh, so the Adobe suite of products, and they'll send us the project file back. Hmm. And then we will relink it to the high quality footage that we have. Uh, we have a 21 terabyte uh, network attached storage on yeah, the boat. Wow. Nice. Uh, where we keep a lot of footage and then we'll link it up to the high quality files and then we'll do, you know, the final touches and then export it and upload it. So it's, it's kind of an inter interesting process to do from out here, but, uh, yeah, it's cool. You know, basically we're cutting out the middleman, mm. by, uh, which used to be the networks and the broadcast stations by, mm. uh, cause now we just go directly to the audience via YouTube and social media. So. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I think people love that that lack of, um, you know, the gatekeeper. You know, like yeah, yeah exactly. C well, we can do what we want, right? No, nobody has to tell us. Yeah, hundred we'll, percent. We'll give you money if you do this. We'll just say, well, yeah. we're going to do something that we enjoy, and if people want to support it and see more of it, then we'll yeah. be able to continue. And that's that's what it is. Yeah, I love it. So, um, yeah. So, in terms of hardware on the boat, like, um, what are you guys filming with, and and how do you capture sound? Uh, well. We have our primary, like main camera is a Panasonic GH5. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, it's a great camera. Uh, we got a bunch of lenses for it, ranging from like an eight mil fixed lens all the way up to like a, a three hundred mil like telephoto. Hmm. Uh, we have a, a Rode external mic. Like one of the things that we really take a lot of pride in is audio quality. Mm. And so everything we have has an external mic with a big dead cat on it to block wind noise. Hmm. Uh, we film a lot with GoPros. Uh, we film a lot with uh, DJI, uh, the Osmo Gimbal, and also the their new action camera, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, what else do we got? Uh, you got drones, got a, I saw. Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, two or three different drones, like mostly because I tend to crash things and <laughs> I need to have a spare. But, uh, yeah, we mostly uh, we've found the DJI drones to be you know, the I, I have a Phantom I love to fly, but they're not making the Phantom anymore. So now I fly like the um, Mavic uh, 2 Zoom. I really like that one. That's pretty cool. cool. Uh, and then the, the plain Mavic Pro when I'm flying from the boat, that's sort of the expendable drone yeah, uh, in case I dunk it in the water, which happens. Mm. And um, we have a Zoom uh, H1N mic that sometimes I'll just take it into the like if we're hiking around the forest, I'll just take it and set it in there and just record forest noises. Ah, nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, audio yeah. is key. Yeah, having an awesome soundscape is pretty cool. I use Zoom gear myself. Like I, I record on an H5. Most of the podcasts I do and uh, Shure yeah. SM58s for on the road and stuff. So, yeah. They're I, great. I, I love good sound. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm a podcast dude, so definitely like um, good sound. Yeah, no, nah, cool. Um, I'm going to keep following the SV Dallas um, adventures. Like, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's really cool to, to chat with you. I was going to ask, um, someone asked about spearfishing. Like, um, they made a comment that they don't see a lot of spearfishing on your channel. And, and, and he speculated that possibly it was because of negative stigma around it. I mean, what's your... Yeah, I mean, speak, speak to that if you can. 
Yeah, well, we actually stopped for, uh, let's see, we stopped for the entire time we were in Asia hmm. uh, oh, yeah. because it was just, I mean, we stopped fishing, we stopped hmm. trolling, we stopped doing everything just because, I don't know, the, the ocean, every, every place we went, the only place that we could find any sort of marine life was hmm. reserves and parks. Yeah, and so you know you're, you're there to scuba dive, and we photograph. It's just destroyed. Mm. Uh, you know, whenever they're spear fishing, like we we love to do it. We just want to make sure that it's done in a sustainable way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, we didn't spear fish a lot, uh, with the exception of lionfish through the Caribbean, until we got to the Bahamas, uh, mm. and that was the first time in a number of years that we found like healthy, sustainable water where you could actually spear fish a site and then you could come back the next day at a different site and you could still find you know something else you're not like hitting the same sites that a bunch of other people have hit day after day where it's really you know pounding on the you know on the sustainability of like the species that are living in that reef yeah um you know, there's some terrible things out there like in in indonesia uh we saw a, a dynamite bomber so he would li was literally sitting in his canoe and he would light sticks of dynamite and he would throw them off the boat hmm. and it would blow everything up, including the reef, kill yeah. all the fish. And then he would swim around and, and, and just grab it, but nothing regenerates that way. Yeah. Um, that sucks. So, yeah, man. I mean, I, 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 I love it. I love fishing. Like I love fishing. I love trolling. I love spear fishing. I love sustaining myself via food that I catch. Like I think that everybody who eats an animal should have the opportunity to kill it themselves and know, you know, what, what that's about and where that food is coming from. Um, and so we don't, we don't do it like every place we go, but when we find a place where, where we feel right about it, we do it. I guess that's the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not nah, cool. I, I, yeah, that's a good insight actually. Like I, I hadn't really thought about, you know, the, the amount of ground you guys have covered and stuff like that. Um, is there anything you, you think that, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the problem with fisheries is, is uh, you know, it's management and it, it's managed on a country by country basis. And some of these big parts of Asia and stuff, like a lot of it just seems to be awareness and political will. And they, they don't seem to have much of either uh, with the regards to, you know, marine conservation and management. Um, is there anything we can do to influence those situations? I mean, I mean, your, your YouTube channel probably goes away to doing it. You just share your story and what your ideas are and what you see and stuff like that. But it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's a list. I can't, I can't remember the name, but if you, if you search on, you know, seafood or fish, that's okay to eat. Mm. There's, there's a list, the, the, the link I found, and I can't remember the link right now, but it was a link to a PDF file that says, these are the fish that, are sustainable for these reasons. And it has a lot more to do with just the amount of fish that are taken. It has to do with their reproductive rate, their gestation cycle, like how quickly they can reproduce, their time to maturity, all these factors play into it, right? Mm. And that's how you create a sustainable fishery is understanding that uh, and, and taking it from there. And some places are doing it. Some places don't give a damn. Like we were you know, off the coast of Madagascar between uh, Mozambique and Madagascar in the, in the Mozambique channel. And we were at a place called Basasta, India. If you search on that, it's B-A-S-S-A-S-D-A, -S 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 India. It's this tiny little atoll, literally in the middle of nowhere. Mm. It is a fantastically healthy place because nobody lives there. It's amazing. It's incredible. But we saw a gigantic Japanese fishing boat just sitting right outside of, of the preserve, just oh, scooping wow. whatever up they could. And you're like, well, how bad do things have to be to, to come all the way from the Pacific across the Indian ocean to, to, to do that. And yeah. uh, I mean, people are, populations are growing. People are looking at, for resources and mm. uh, other countries. They need money more than, you know, who knows? Mm. So it's, what about it is what it is. 
we'll, we'll, we'll segue neatly into some, something funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the demise, of, besides the demise, of, the slow demise of the oceans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it gets a bit depressing. I mean, there is so yeah, much. I, I think in some places, you know, we're roaring ahead and, and moving really well, you know. But in other places, it, it's lagging far behind. And but here's, here's one thing I'll leave you with that that's on a positive note is mm. we've also been to places that have been destroyed. And after they're left alone, they recover. Mm. And so you'll you'll see this thing in in some parts of the Philippines where they will create these no take zones. You mm. cannot fish or take anything from this area, but you can fish and take from around it. And what actually happens is it serves as like a as a nursery, as a breeding ground, and mm. the fish grow, they eat, they become healthy, and then they wander out. Mm. And you know that's that, that's that actually works pretty well. Uh, yeah, so that, that shows some hope, and if you, if you do leave it alone, it, it will come back. Yeah, I have heard of, about the efficacy of that particular sort of technique in, in in some parts of the world and in some specific marine environments. It's unfortunate. I, I don't know that it necessarily works everywhere, but yeah, it's it's definitely one one management tool that um, is is in their chest, and it's good to hear the Philippines are getting involved in it because their government hasn't had a, a great reputation. So yeah, it's that is yeah. cool to hear. Um, funniest, funniest stuff out. Particularly ten years on the boat. Um, you've already shared some some shit stories with with regards to the use of the toilet. But what other like yeah, what stuff's been really funny over the years? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I don't know how funny this is, but we were uh, cleaning a bunch of fish in uh, in Cocos Keeling, and uh, we were. You know, there was some sharks coming up to the boat and, you know, we'd been throwing scraps of, of fish skin and carcasses off the back of the boat or whatever. And my brother Brady uh, decided that he wanted to wash the fish uh, off of his hands. And so not even thinking about it, he stuck his hand over the side of the boat and like, you know, like flapped it around in the water and a barracuda came up and, and bit through his hand and it's 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 funny now because like we got him stitched up and we got him taken care of but i mean that's just like it's something you don't think about that you you know you like you can actually get bit by a barracuda and it, you know the teeth will go through your thumb or something like that oh, well. maybe it's not funny I, I i see the humor in that no <laughs> there's definitely some humor in there i think did, did it like <laughs> How, did he get any? Is there a risk of infection when a barracuda bites you? Oh, well, apparently not, because we went to the doctor and she's like, "Well, if it was like a dog or you know a, a land creature, then we'd worry more about that. But we'll just soak it in iodine water and, and stitch it up and send you on your way." So, you know, apparently fish do not have that much possibility, you know. And he didn't get infected, so yeah, sweet. Yeah, so iodine and, good. and stitches, and he and he came right. Yeah, and did he yeah. did he earn himself a nickname because of that, or? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my brother has a, a tendency to get bit by many things. He also got bit by a monkey in Thailand. Uh, uh, he got bit by uh, a, a human uh, in uh, South Africa, um, and uh, it's. Uh, also an eel. I've never seen anybody get bit by an eel, but my brother got bit by an eel in Madagascar. Okay. Like how random is that? There must be um, something in him, like animals. He's just they just like him. Yeah. Mm. Uh, as far as other funny stuff, man, that's so tough. There's been so many, so many random things mm. that have happened on the boat with people and sexual experiences and i don't know how much we can go into that but it's, i mean you're, you're living you're living on a boat with like you know a bunch of adults in their 20s and 30s and uh, yeah you know there's well, there's no secrets i was um recently out on a charter boat in new zealand we did a multi-day trip out to the the three kings islands and um the skipper was telling us about a crew member of his who he was on night watch and the skipper's come up on top and just caught him uh whacking off at the <laughs> and then uh the the kid the kid he was like i think he was in his late teens or early 20s he's just looked back and gone what and just carried on <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh, uh i was just like oh. so I, I used to be a software developer mm. uh, that was my my previous life i call it my bs life my before sailing life yeah nice and uh when we were sailing across the pacific the first year 
always a little bit bored having this time off. And so, you know, I would notice that people are supposed to be on watch. And when you're on watch, figure two or three hours, you know, you're supposed to check the radar, scan the horizon for lights, do all these things. And, and people were sort of drifting off and not paying attention. And so I wrote this program that was on our navigation laptop. And basically like every 15 minutes, it would have this red screen that would come up and this button you would have to push on the keyboard. Mm. And if you push that button within 30 seconds, it would show you a picture of a naked girl. <laughs> and if you because we're all guys on the boat. And if it, if you waited or missed that 30 second window, then it, it showed you a picture of uh, balls. And so <laughs> it was really, it was really, you know, good for people to be paying attention so they could get the, the random Chief, is naked that, female shot instead of balls. Yeah. That's applying gamification to a whole new level. I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, all right, so what's SV Dallas sort of what's the next sort of six months look like? What's what's coming up? Well, it depends a lot on where we can go. I mean, you know, places are starting to open up now. Uh, hmm. I don't know if that's good or not, but uh, you know, we're we're cold and uh, we, we're going to sail south back to the tropics. So we're going to meander our way down the, the coast of the U.S., maybe jump off to Bermuda or the Bahamas. And uh, I don't know, I just read about Belize the other day. Like Belize has the second biggest barrier reefs, second only to Australia. And so, yeah, right, eh? you know, like that's, that sounds cool. Never been to Belize. So we could, we could sail down to Belize, maybe hit Mexico, get mm. some tacos and then, you know, head on down to the Panama Canal and be back in the Pacific. I don't know. It's like, mm. what about Ciguatera? C- like, um, th- you do get it in that part of the world, I believe. Oh yeah, yep, yep. Uh, you know, we're we're actually very aware of the type of fish we eat, and uh, you know, I, I like to troll a lot off the boat. And one of the things you catch a lot in the waters of the Bahamas is barracuda. Mm. And barracuda, nobody eats them because they have cinquatera. They eat other fish that have cinquatera, and so it sort of builds up in their system. So that's that's one of the things we don't eat. Uh, we go places, and we tend to ask the locals what they eat. They're like, mm. do you eat this fish here? Do you eat this fish here? Uh, some people think you can have an immunity to it. I'm not sure that that's actually possible uh, mm. because of the, you know, it's a neurotoxin and it, it mm. accumulates in your body. And so if people say, no, we eat the fish here, I, I tend to think, you know, it's a pretty safe thing to do is, is just do whatever the locals do. Cause they, they will tell you like, no, the fish here make us sick. Yeah. And so, you know, but it, yeah, it's, it's a real thing. I've known people that I've never had it. Yeah. Uh, I've known people that have, and it's, it's not fun. I'm pretty sure I've got a mild dose of it at the moment, and um, but I'm I, I don't think the fish I have are significantly riddled with it, like, but they have must have a level of it because I'm eating quite I've eaten quite a couple of big um, quantities of of this king mackerel, and oh um, yeah, and the first time I, I had like chronic fatigue, but I didn't get any of the tingling that you're supposedly supposed to get i just got um really sore muscles and joints and like chronic fatigue like where i had to have an extra sleep during the day and things like that and low energy levels it faded away after about a week and a half and then i (laughs) but i went out about a month later and then i ate another big bit of this mackerel and uh i feel the same again it's not quite as severe as the first time but yeah it's just sort of turning me off fish at the moment which is really um that sucks because I, I love fish. So yeah, no, yeah. I've, I've heard that from other people as well. Like it is, it is cumulative and it takes a long time to, to it's stored in, and I think it's stored in fatty tissue, right? Mm. So, so, I don't know. Don't yeah. quote me on that, but it sounds reasonable. Yeah. I, I, uh, my, my, uh, my former co-host um, Turbo, like he used to, he he got a real bad bout of it once, and um, so that's kind of why I even know anything about it. But uh, my experience has been different, I think, to his. But uh, maybe I need to compare notes with him. So, yeah, nah, cool. Yeah. Um, awesome to catch up with you, Brian. Am I going to miss? Are we going to get a chance to catch up with Karen today, or is yeah, she, I, she, I I can grab her real quick if you want. Oh, all right, sweet. Yeah, Look, stand by, stand by. All I'll right. be right back. An upgrade to composite or carbon fibre fins often marks the stage of the next step of your spearfishing evolution. 
composite or carbon fibre confer a huge advantage in terms of performance for the Spiro. Not only will you get better performance in the water, but you will suffer from less fatigue as well. And I'm going to recommend the fins that I wear myself, Penetrator Fins. You can check them out at penetratorfins.com. They've got the best warranty in the industry, and you can get a discount today by using the code NOOBSPIRO and save $25 on any set of Penetrator Fins. Penetratorfins.com, proud sponsors of the Noob Spiro podcast. This episode of the Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you in partnership with Neptonics. Neptonics creates, designs, and manufactures the best gear to land your fish of a lifetime. Visit neptonics.com and use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off storewide, N-O-O-B-1-0 at neptonics.com. Partners of the Noob Spirit Podcast. All right, uh, I've got the baby and the baby <laughs> mama here. She's putting her headphones in. Perfect. I got the other. I won't be able to hear him, but you will. I got the. Hello. The, hello, Karen. It's um. Hi. Isaac here. Nice to meet you. It's good to talk to the other half of the the SV Delos t- uh, pair. Yeah. Nice to talk to you too. Mm-hmm. Um, how's that mooring going with the baby? Is it is it a good mooring? Yeah. No, she's actually in a really good mood today, so it's been a good day. Oh, cool, cool. Um, I've been I've been chatting with your husband for an hour nonstop now, and uh, it's it's nice to meet you as well, and and briefly touch base. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I was just putting all the food away and getting everything sorted. It's a little different now with a baby. Yeah. It's hard to do things together sometimes. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So. Um, you you flew back to Sweden to have the baby and then came back and Brian was saying you were in um, in the Bahamas for 16 weeks. Yeah, for a long time. It was it was the best place to get kind of stuck though. Yeah. We were really lucky and we had planned it uh, to be out there anyway. So it was kind of, uh, yeah, it was a, even in the bad circumstances, it was a really good thing for us. Yeah, cool. And the motherhood journey on the sailboat, is that is that a, it's got a fair, fair ch- set of challenges, I'd imagine? Yeah, I think anybody that kind of, you know, have raised a kid or, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it has a lot of challenges. And I mm. think doing it on the boat just adds a whole nother dimension. <laughs> and uh, some days it's, yeah, it's really tough, but um, I love it. It's it's added something completely new to this whole adventure. And she, she's great. She's a really good kid. Wow, awesome. How old is she now? Oh, she's just going on 14 months. <laughs> Oh wow! So yeah. starting to starting to walk and run around and get themselves into trouble. Yeah, she's definitely doing that pretty much a yeah. thousand times a day. I feel like I'm saving her life. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, um, sorry to hear the water's so dirty up there because, um, yeah, it, 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 it sounds it sounds like a nice break from the from the heat, but um, but maybe you'd get over it pretty fast as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been up here for what, like a few months now, and I think we're getting ready to kind of, yeah, go back south and get into the little warmer weather. Some things are a lot harder up here, and yeah, we haven't been in the water for quite a while now, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. Cool, cool. Um, I'm just about to head off and, and leave you guys, but I, I did want to ask um, what, what you're sort of most excited about happening in the next six, 12 months. Wow, what am I most excited about? Yeah, the swimming again, getting in the water again. I'm really excited about that and showing that kind of life to Sierra. Yep. I think being up here is, has its perks and it's amazing and it's exactly what we wanted. But I think now we got to kind of like bug again to imagine having Sierra on a you know white sand beach and have her swimming in the water. And like, yep. yeah, it has some very, very nice things to do. I've been, I've been enjoying um, just catching up and having a good look at your YouTube channel. So it's SV Dallas on YouTube for, for people that want to um, check it out. Um, where, where else can people come and connect with you guys? Yeah, just, yeah, YouTube, SV Dallas, uh, search for that. And uh, Instagram, that's where we post all the um, kind of current stuff. So where we are now and everything that is going on and more behind the scenes stuff. So same there, you search on SV Dallas. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We do everything else, of course, like Facebook and our website and stuff. But you search on Espidelos and there we are. 
Cool. Awesome, awesome to meet you, Karen, even if it was just briefly today because you were on mum duty. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for touching base with us. And it's Sierra, Sierra is your daughter's name? Yeah, Sierra, like the mountains. Yeah, cool, nice. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Th- thanks for chatting with me. Yeah, thank you for saying hi, and, uh, yeah, chat to you soon. I'm back. Yeah, cool. Hey, it was nice to just touch base with you, even if I was just briefly, but um, yeah, I'm just conscious of time. And um, yeah, so I, w- I wanted to ask, um, Karen said people can connect with you guys on Instagram and there at YouTube and stuff. Uh, she talked a little bit about, you know, what she's looking forward to uh, and, you, and you've and you covered off some of the things as well. But um, I was wondering if you had any other message for the, the spearfishing community out there. Don't chase the fish, let them come to you. Oh, nice. Nice. That that that's a hunting mindset for sure. Awesome to chat with you, Brian. <laughs> yeah, cool, man. And uh, it was really nice to connect with you guys. And um, I'm sure to come over and f- and start following you guys and and keep track of what you're up to. What's the editing um, turnaround cycle like? Because I'm following you on Instagram now. Like, if how long does it take for the YouTube to catch up with with where you guys are at and stuff? Let's see. We're releasing stuff from July right now, so okay. uh, we're about three months, something like that. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. It's it's nice when you don't have to rush. Yeah, you know we quality, quality over quantity. We always try to focus on. So perfect. Oh, good. Well, thanks for joining me today, Brian. Real pleasure, man. Real pleasure. Thanks for the chat. I had a lot of fun. As I mentioned in the intro, a, a much shorter interview today, but I really enjoyed it chatting with Brian and Katie and uh, hearing a little bit about their sailing journey. I think it's um, something maybe a lot of people that love the water would aspire to, is just living a life on the water all the time. And uh, check out their channel on YouTube, SV Dallas, and uh, what a what a, what a a cool family. Hey, um, in two weeks, we're off for another exciting interview. It's Big Jake Lords, finally. I really want to get this episode out there. I've been following Big Jake on instagram for a long time and uh he's just a frother like he he deal he deals a lot of the time with these high altitude freshwater lakes but he gets around all over the place as well he's a he's an accomplished bureau he's a fantastic personality on instagram if you follow him big jake lords um check him out but in two weeks we're back for big jake lords uh i will see you then hey if you love the podcast as well i would definitely love it if you jumped on and became a patron listener at patreon.com forward slash noobspiro join more than 30 frothing fans over there and support the show on an episode by episode basic check it out patreon.com forward slash noobspiro i'm out thanks guys jeepers spearfishing has to be the most addictive thing it takes over if you're not actually out there spearfishing you're talking about spearfishing you're listening to spearfishing and you're always shopping for spearfishing gear today's sponsor comes in super handy for that spearfishing.com.au you can check out a whole bunch of great brands they've got brands on there like rob allen rife picasso salvamas borisa Boshat, shark shield the list just keeps going now i love the the shopping experience at spearfishing.com.au they've been sponsoring this show since episode 18 i would encourage you to head over there check out equipment whole range huge range of equipment check out the reviews if you do decide to purchase something use the code noob Spiro on any purchase over 200 and save yourself 20 dollars spearfishing.com.au support the noob Spiro podcast you can't go wrong